Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today I have a special treat for you. I want to highlight three of my favorite fellow YouTube creators. And I want to do this by looking at some of the arguments that you will commonly see in Flat Earth videos. Let's start off with a beautiful demonstration of Earth curvature from Soundly down in New Orleans. This is a beautiful and undistorted view of the Lake Pontchartrain causeway taken by Soundway from the 15th floor of a hotel. He has done this numerous times. We've sat down and modeled this on computers. We've drawn lines on them. And it clearly demonstrates curvature of the Earth. Yet our friends in the Flat Earth are always looking for ways that this is CGI or distorted. And this is a favorite. You start off with a premise, the sea and the Earth are flat. And therefore, because this image shows curvature, you must be using a fisheye lens. So let's start off with a short but very informative presentation by my friend Rory from New Zealand on the effects of lenses on photographs. We've often heard about fisheyes, but there's barrel distortions, etc. And he's going to go over that all in about three minutes. Once he's done with that presentation, let's have a look at these laser experiments that the Flat Earth seems to love so much. You know, the famous I see the flash experiments. Here's one from Dr. John D. out in England where they're shooting a laser about 10 or 15 miles. And as you see, it's very, very close to the ground. And oh my God, they can see the laser. The Earth must be flat. Likewise, here is the famous Monterey Bay mirror test. And, oh my God, they can see the uh, mirror from 15 miles at sea level. The Earth must be flat. And finally, we have the famous Flat Earth scholar, Mr. D. Marble, out in Seattle, or Tacoma, actually. Now, here is his laser on Puget Sound. You know, they can see the laser on the other end, as you can see in the insert. My God, the Earth must be flat. Or is it? Let's look at that laser a little bit. You see where it's generated on the tripod there, and then you see the far shore where it's going, but isn't that laser actually curving down some? Why don't you have a little closer look at that? And as a matter of fact, why don't we go over to my friend Mick West, who is going to give a presentation on laser tests specifically and why they are unreliable. I think you'll find it very informative. So let's cue up the music and get it going. What shape is the horizon? If you're on the ISS looking out of the window or taking photographs of your Nikon D4 of the Earth below you, it's very easy to tell. Or if you're on a commercial flight and you're lucky enough to be a pilot at 46,000 feet looking through the cockpit window, you can tell very clearly. Or if you've got an infrared lens on your camera and you can cut through the haze, you can also see the curve of the horizon. But what about for us mere mortals? How can we tell for ourselves? Well, here's a photo I took from about 575 feet. The horizon looks flat. But if we take a closer look, we can see that it's curved. That's because the horizon on a sphere forms the edge of a circle. And if we squeeze the sides of that image together, we can see it even more clearly. Now before I go on, a word about camera lenses. Camera lenses can cause straight edges to appear curved. There's barrel distortion, which makes straight lines above the center of the frame curve convexly. There's pincushion distortion, which makes straight lines below the center of the frame curve convexly. And then there's mustache distortion, which makes straight lines appear wavy. One way to test for this is to take a photo of a grid. As we can see, away from the center of the frame, there's evidence of pincushion distortion. The lines in the center of the frame remain undistorted and straight. The center 400 pixels are very good, and the center 200 pixels show straight lines remaining straight when compressed. So this seems to be the sweet spot for capturing a true photograph of the horizon. Now let's have another look at that previous image. The horizon height 
is right around 1512 pixels, right in the very centre of the frame, meaning that the curve of the horizon isn't being caused by lens distortion. But what if all of that wasn't enough to convince you that the horizon is curved? Well, how about we place a straight edge above and below the horizon, take pictures centred in the frame, and then compress them. If the curve of the horizon is caused by the lens, then the straight edge will also curve, but it doesn't. It remains straight, and the horizon remains curved, as it should be on a sphere. I've taken literally hundreds of these pictures, and they all show a curved horizon. Anyone can try this for themselves. All you need is a straight edge or two, about 500 feet of elevation looking out to sea, a good crisp horizon, and a camera. Just a quick note there, a P900 is not the best camera for the job. The way that the image stabilization works actually causes lines to do very strange things. Any questions? Post them in the comments section and I'll answer them in a follow-up video. Or check the description for links to previous discussion on this topic and see if your question has been answered there. Cheers! Earth community, a popular experiment is to shine a laser from a low height across a body of water and see if that laser is visible on the other side. This seems like a reasonable test. If you put the laser and the camera both at three feet above the water and they are, say, six miles apart, then the laser should be hidden behind several feet of the curve of the Earth. And yet, there are all these videos showing people doing this test, sometimes over much longer distances, and sometimes with the laser and the camera even closer to the water. And yet in all these videos, you can see the laser. So what does this mean? Is the Earth flat? No, of course not. The laser is simply bending around the curve of the Earth due to refraction. We've all seen refraction. It's the bending of light towards more dense air. Generally, this goes one of two ways. There's bending upwards if there's some low, warmer air like a hot road or water that's warmer than the air. Or it will be bending downwards, which is what happens normally as lower air is generally denser than higher air. This downwards bending is amplified if the lower air is cooler, like if the water is cooler than the air, which is normally the case during the day and in the evening. In this case, with light bending down towards cooler, denser air, the refraction can bend the light around the curve, and so you can see the light from a laser that would normally be hidden. But if we've got these two cases, light bending up and light bending down, then why do the tests always show the laser visible? Well, they actually don't. If you follow these tests, you'll see people are constantly unable to spot the laser, which they quite uh, correctly blame on the weather. For example, there's a recent test in Brighton where the light was bending upwards, but they could not see the laser. Now we've got another test asking, can the intense source of a laser one meter above the water be recorded 9.5 kilometers away by a camera one meter above the water level? And the answer is yes, of course it can. Why are you even doing this experiment? Don't you watch YouTube? We've seen time and again that lasers are often visible over water when geometrically they should be hidden by the curve, so there should be no surprise. But what's actually going on when you see uh, a laser when you think you shouldn't? Well, there's two things to consider, refraction and beam divergence. divergence. Now, I wrote a uh, refraction simulator. And the refraction simulator basically does what it says. It simulates refraction. We have a picture and we have a temperature profile. And then we simulate where all the beams of light go. And this shows us uh, the resultant image. And you can move the temperature profile uh, around and you can make it colder or, or, or warmer. And you can see what effect that has. And uh, I have a setup uh, for the Bedford level, which is the site of the experiment I just uh, referenced. And I can load that here, Bedford level boat. This is a bridge which is six miles away. And there's a guy in a boat. He's, he's about four miles away. I'm actually gonna move him. I'm gonna select him here, man in boat. I'm gonna move him out so he's also uh, at six miles. So he's just about where the bridge is. Okay, so you can see he's being squished there, but you can still see him. Now, the viewer here is only four feet above the water, so really you shouldn't be able to see him. And in fact, if we turn off refraction, you'll see that he is in fact uh, 
down below the horizon. We can move him around, move him back here, and you can see he's actually there, moving back out to uh, six feet. I'll just put that in exactly six miles away. And we can raise the viewer height so you can see what's going on. We can go higher so we can actually see the guy down uh, by by the bridge over there. But let's move him back down. So uh, one meter. That's about three feet. So let's go down to about three feet. And recently I added lasers to the mix, turning refraction back on here. And I can switch these on down here. By default, it will set a laser at the camera. So here's where the camera is. Here's where the bridge is. The laser is at four feet here. The camera's at three feet. We can move the laser height of the lasers at five feet. We can move the laser down, we can move it up. Uh, but this is kind of boring because we're just shining uh, towards the guy in the boat. Let's uh, flip the laser direction, which will put the laser, whoo, put the laser at the uh, the bridge or the guy at the boat here. It takes it at the furthest object. I'm going to reduce the power of this laser. It's a bit too bright. And you can see here's the laser in the boat. It's at uh, 1.7 feet. I'll make that three feet. So it's the same as in the experiment. So we've got a laser six miles away. We have the viewer, the camera at three feet. We have the laser at three feet and they're quite visible. So why is this? This, uh, this, this thick green line here is the line of the laser which, you know, you see, you're looking at it here, it looks like it's actually going uh, too high. You wouldn't be able to see it. And uh, what's actually happening, though, is the laser spreads out. It spreads out by one milliradian, which is a thousandth of a radian, which is it's just a small fraction of a, a degree, which isn't really very, very much. It kind of looks like a lot here in this side view, but that's because this side view is very, very, uh, very, very compressed. Uh, horizontally or, or stretch vertically, depending on which way you think of it. And if I turn on the uh, uh, the zoom, and if I set the zoom factor to one, which means this is the actual actual size, you'll see things look very, very, very flat. The uh, the Earth, of course, you know, doesn't curve very much because it's so big. So over six miles, there's hardly any curve. It looks pretty much flat. Uh, we can zoom in to reveal the curve, and uh, we can see. This is the spread of the laser beam. Uh, if I change the angle of the laser, you'll see the green lines in the middle, and there's two green lines, one on either side. This is showing the divergence of a laser, and as I said, it's being magnified because uh, we, we're magnifying the curve uh, so we can see what's going on. So if I go back down to one, it would actually look like that, which, you know, it looks like a straight line, but it's actually diverging very, very slightly. Anyway, so this uh, laser beam starts over here, and it goes in this direction and the bottom of it spreads to here and the top spreads to here. So if it's uh, angled down a little bit, so it's down more like it was before, uh, the top of the laser beam could be uh, going way over the camera, but the bottom of the laser beam is just touching the camera, just managed to make it around the curve of the Earth. And you can see down here, you can just see that beam uh, start to come in. So the divergence of the laser beam actually has uh, quite a quite a significant effect and that it makes it very very easy to see the beam kind of no matter what direction you're pointing it in like you can up or down because there's always going to be some light path which goes over just over the curve of the earth uh, let me just get rid of uh, uh, this real quick I'll just move it over here and I'll move this into a so you can see it a little bit better and I'm going to zoom in a bit more so Here's the camera, and here's where the laser is. Both of them are three feet above the ground. And there's, even though the, the laser beam is shining up like this, there's still a light path which goes from the laser to the camera. And you can actually see that by moving this around here until we get to the laser. So this yellow line here is a path that the laser takes. Now if we uh, zoom down a little bit more, it will zoom down, if it tilts down a little bit more, uh, you'll see the laser will actually get brighter as the center of the beam goes uh, closer and closer. Now, why is it uh, refracting around? Well, it's because the, the water is cooler. And I've got this little graph here, which shows this very, very slight cool water, then slightly warmer air, and then just moving. This is hardly anything. This is about a tenth of a degree. It really, really does not take uh, very much at all to get uh, the actual uh, results that we're looking for here. Now, of course, if the uh, 
the air was uh, you know, even warmer, then you get even more refraction of it because more visible. But if the air is just a little bit cooler than the water, the water is warmer, then we don't see the laser. So very, very small variations can have quite a big effect. Uh, we can see the laser here, move this over here. Uh, you, you can't see it. Yeah, you can see it. You can't see it. And this, I'm just moving basically about a tenth of a degree either way. So, and it's only in the bottom 10 feet or so, and it could be even less. I can focus down on the bottom like one or two feet and just very, very small, very, very small adjustments in the temperature. So because you don't actually know the temperature all the way along this path, all the way along this six mile path, it's actually quite difficult to figure out what's actually going on and actually what you see uh, in terms of what the refraction is a better indication of uh, what the, the temperature is along that path than the actual measurements you would make, say, at the start and the end of that path. Uh, now, you see here, I've put the laser in the boat. And the reason I've got this boat here is that the original Robotham experiment uh, back in the 1800s uh, didn't have lasers back then, of course. You know, we, they just had guys in boats. So what they did is they got a guy in a boat and he uh, he started out here, and he just you know, rode his boat all the way over to the bridge, and they looked at him from a telescope set three feet, I mean, it might, might have been two feet above the waterline, and they found that they could actually see him the whole way. And this was because, of course, uh, of refraction. It's exactly the same thing here, a very slight difference in your know, slightly cooler water, or much cooler water in, you know, in some cases, uh, lets you see uh, around the, the curve of the Earth because it's bending the, the light down. So that wasn't a very good experiment back in the 1800s, and the laser experiment right next to the water is not a very good experiment either. So what should you do instead? Well, you should use bigger things and you should use higher viewpoints. Uh, get away from the random deviations of the laser being a, a few feet uh, either way above uh, above the surface of the water, just grazing the horizon, and try to look at the bigger picture. Use mountains and use tall buildings. For example, can you see all of Catalina Island from Santa Monica? No, you can't. Can you see all of San Giacchino, uh, Giacchino mountain from Malibu? No, you can't. Can you see all of Toronto from across the lake? No, you can't. Can you see the curve of the Earth from a plane from 35,000 or 40,000 feet? Yes, you can. So these laser tests are fun and interesting demonstrations of refraction, but they're very misleading if you pretend refraction isn't happening. To get the real big picture, you have to rise above refraction. Oh, as a little bonus, let me give you this clip from my friend Dang Jose. This is a demonstration of refraction using butane and a tank. See how he puts the butane on there, and due to the layer of cold air, you can see the red clay that is below what would be our horizon. With the effects of refraction, we can see it. And if you had any doubt, you can also see a light that is well below the horizon, like this one. Have a look. There it is. See how it pokes up? Well, this is Bob the Science Guy. Thank you very much for stopping by, and make sure you like and subscribe to my channel. This rabbit hole's too deep for me Feel my brain getting real sore